So welcome to church this morning and we are at the uh, midway point of our series called Christ in the Carols and we decided as a preaching team to pick a few carols and then speak into those carols and find Jesus in them because these carols were written around a central figure and week number one we looked at Holy Night and last week Dan our youth and young adults pastor shared O Come all you faithful, and he did a brilliant job sharing and unpacking that particular carol. And today, as the song we heard earlier suggests, we're going to look at Away in a Manger. Turn to verse next and go, ah. I say ah because it's one of those songs that that draws out an ah within us, okay? So turn to the other person, your second choice, and say ah to them, that'd be great. A little bit of background to this particular carol is that uh, it was very first published in 1885 in a Lutheran Sunday school curriculum. And although the author is unknown, some suggest that it was Martin Luther himself who wrote this song and it was known as Luther's Tale. Um, But there are many scholars that uh, would disagree that Martin Luther wrote this particular uh, carol. And so the author is a little bit of a mystery. Although the author's a mystery, one thing we know for sure, what is not a mystery, is that this song invokes great emotion from people every time it's sung, particularly around the Christmas season. Some of the lyrics are, Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus lay down his sweet head. The stars in the bright sky looked down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. The cattle are lowing, the poor baby awakes. The little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. This particular carol obviously is based on Scripture. And the portion of Scripture I want to turn our attention to this morning is found in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 2 verses four to seven, where we read, so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judah, to, sorry, to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he longed to the house, sorry, belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born and she gave birth to a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no room available for them. The amazing thing about this portion of Scripture is that at that time, scholars and experts and religious leaders alike were expecting a Messiah. We're expecting God to come and to rid the earth of the tyranny that they were involved in. They were expecting the Messiah. They were expecting the King of the Jews to come and rule and lead them out of slavery and into a newfound freedom. They were believing it. They spoke about it. Every Sabbath, they would talk. They would teach. They would discuss these truths. And so there there was not one religious leader that was not expecting a child. However, The thing they were not expecting was the Messiah to come in such a way. They were not expecting the Messiah to come as a babe in a manger. I mean, this this carol refers to this baby as little Lord Jesus. I mean, this is God of the universe in a stable, in a manger because there was no room at the local hotel. And there he was born in this incredible impoverished environment and people's expectation turned to disappointment because they could not believe for one moment that this could possibly be the answer to all of the world's problems. There was a high expectation and because the expectation was high, the disappointment was matched and they were very disappointed because what good can come from a little baby born in a manger? I don't know about you, if you've ever received presents at Christmas, who loves receiving presents at Christmas? I, I know I do. But every now and then you get, you get gifts 
and you get gifts with, and you, you comes with a high expectation. Whenever you see something wrapped, like you say, oh my goodness, what is it? We start shaking it. We say, oh my God. And we start thinking and imagining all the great things it could be. And the longer we think about it, the greater the expectation gets. And the more excited we get, and the more excited we get, guess what? Unless it is what we want it to be, we're setting ourselves up for incredible disappointment. And these religious leaders were expecting a Messiah, but they put their spin on it. They put their twist on it. And because their spin and twist was not within the will of God, they missed the moment and they missed the message that was behind the manger. Much like we do when it comes to receiving our gifts. Oh, I wonder what it could be. And, and pretty soon we're thinking, oh, you know what? I wonder if there's a set of keys in here. I wonder if mum and dad have got me a brand new car and, and then they've just wrapped it up in something just to disguise the incredible gifts. And then we do. Is, oh, is that just me? Is that just me? And, and so with great excitement, we, we rip into it. And because our excitement and expectation is so high. How many have ever received a pair of socks and jocks for Christmas? And we're like, it's not the gift we were expecting. It's not the gift we were wanting. It's not the gift we were hoping for. And yet, it's a gift we all need. If I was to go around the room and say, who's wearing socks and jocks today? I mean, there'd be a good chance that most of you. <laughs> Some brave people, maybe not, but generally speaking. <laughs> and here's this little gift. But it's actually a highly needed gift. Yes. It may not be the ones we were hoping for. But some gifts are gifts that everyone needs even though they're not too exciting. How many would agree with that this morning? But if you think about socks and jocks, just for a moment, and some of you didn't think you'd have to think about socks and jocks on a Sunday morning in church, but I just want you to think about it. Because socks and jocks, at the end of the day, are not a real bad gift. Because... They provide incredible support. <laughs> Comfort. I mean, shoes with socks are far more comfortable than shoes without socks. And of course, they're very affordable. Hence why we get so many socks and jocks for Christmas. And I say all that to say this, that this is also true for the very first Christmas because Jesus is a gift that every one of us needs. But some of us don't get too excited about that. Just like we don't get excited about socks and jocks, but we find that actually something that we all need. Jesus is someone that we all need. Although some of us may not feel like they're too excited about this particular gift. And if we're not careful, we're going to miss the message of the manger. Just like we can miss in our disappointment the actual value of our socks and jocks that we receive at Christmas. And many of you are going to receive socks and jocks at Christmas. So maybe we can put a positive spin on that this year. But it takes time to reflect upon the value of them in order to see the value that they are and bring to you. And so it is when it comes to this babe in a manger. And if we don't take time to stop and reflect on the message of the manger, we're going to miss what it is that God was trying to say to us through the manger. And so this morning, I want to highlight just three things that I believe the manger can teach us and show us 
today that we can reflect on and leave this place today with a greater appreciation, not only of this carol, but of the message that's behind the carol, and that is the message of the manger. And uh, the first one is simply this, that there is the miracle of the manger. Everyone say miracle. There's a miracle of the manger. The Bible says that a virgin will be with child. Now, when you read that a virgin is going to have a baby, it's either a myth or a miracle. It can't be both. It cannot be a miracle and a myth. It's either a myth and if it is a myth and it's not true, we should just go home today because everything rests upon this point. But if it is a miracle, we need to listen up and say, wow, and what can we learn from this particular miracle? Because this I know, virgins do not have babies. It's hard to believe that Mary, a virgin, could conceive. I'll tell you how hard it is. Mary herself did not believe. Mary was visited by an angel and she was startled. She was afraid. And the angel said to her, don't be afraid. Mary, you found favour with God. And the Holy Spirit will overshadow you and you will be with child. And she said, how can, how can that be? I'm not married. I've never been with a man. And the angel said, what is impossible for man is possible with God. See, people don't believe in miracles because miracles lie on the outside of what is possible for us. But I want you to understand this thought today. Impossibilities don't deny the existence of God. They simply highlight the limitations of humanity. And that's why I'm very uh, okay with the fact that I don't understand, even as a preacher, a preacher of God's Word over the last 25 plus years, I don't have all the answers. If I had all the answers, I would be God. I'm very comfortable with the fact that I don't know a whole lot that there is to know about God. And that's what makes Him God. I can't explain every season, the good seasons, the miracles, or the bad seasons and the tough seasons. I find it very comfortable to know that I can't explain those things because my finite understanding is not within the realm of God's infinite understanding. I'll say it again, impossibilities don't deny the existence of God. They simply highlight the limitations of our humanity. See, the virgin birth doesn't make sense to us, but we need to be reminded that God's the one who created sense in the first place. And God is not limited to the boundaries that we are. And to believe in God is to believe in a being that is not bound by our limitations. And so God is able to live outside of the limitations that we live in. Impossible and impossibilities are words that don't exist in heaven's vocabulary. A a miracle is something that God does within the realm of nature, but it's just sped up. Jesus' very first miracle was turning water into wine. There's a big part of water in wine. God just sped up the process. That's what a miracle is. It's not outside of the realms of nature. It's just sped up. That's what miracles do. When someone has a miracle in the body of healing, it's God supernaturally speeding up the healing process in a body in a moment. Something could take weeks or months or even years. God does something supernaturally, exponentially, quicker than we can do based upon our own limitations. So the fact that God is a miracle working God is okay with me and I trust that it's okay with you. That's what makes Him God. And it's this virgin birth that is the tipping point because this virgin birth changes history because Jesus is the God man and not just a holy man. He didn't come from a human lineage. He came direct from God. So he wasn't tainted with sin as we are. So when he was offered as a sacrifice on the cross some 33 years later, he did it as a sinless human being whose blood was not tainted with sin as yours and mine is. This virgin birth changes the course of history. It also means that God loves us. It was God who took the first step towards redeeming humanity. I say this all the time. 
that a relationship for it to work takes two. But what I love about Jesus' response is that He initiated this love advance. He left the splendour of heaven. He came to planet Earth to show the world just how much He loves us and is willing to do life with us and forgive us. It also means that man, you and I are not alone. That He's Emmanuel. He is God and He's God with us. This is not just a babe in a manger. This is a beautiful miracle that took place. Let us never take the manger for granted. There is a miracle that took place in the manger. Secondly, we're going to look at the mess. Everyone say mess. The mess of the manger. A manger is basically a long open box or trough for horses or cattle to eat from or to drink from. There's no mention of a manger being used to nurse babies. This was an exception. This was something that wasn't done before. Just like this miraculous moment that took place with a virgin birth, now we see Jesus, the Lord Jesus placed in a manger, which is really just an eating trough for animals. And and, and I get that animals are cute and cuddly. Who likes animals? Do we have any animal lovers out there? I, I do. I, I love. I don't love all animals, but I love a lot of animals. And and I never forget before we got our dog. Uh, our kids really wanted a dog, and and uh, I, I said to them, you know, dogs are great. They're cute and they're cuddly, but they make a mess. And my question was, who's going to clean up the poo? You know, it's okay to have a dog, but dogs make mess. And who's going to clean up the poo? And that job fell to Mitch, and and we're still waiting for him to actually <laughs> take up that job. But anyway, that's fine. But, but they do, they're cute and they're cuddly, but they make a mess. And it was Jesus born into this messy environment. And I think there's something significant, significant and powerful about that. That he was born into a messy environment. Which means he can identify with the mess and the messy environments that we find ourselves in. If you find yourself saying, man, this world's a mess. My life's a mess. My marriage is a mess. My family's a mess. My children are a mess. If there's an aspect of your life that is messy, or maybe it's not your life, but maybe it's within the sphere of influence that you have, someone in your life has experienced some of the messiness of life. That's because life is messy. And just like wherever there are animals, there is mess. Wherever there are people, there is mess. People often say to me, if there's God's a God of love, why do bad things happen? It's because we live in a messy world, because where there is a world of people, there are people and people are beautiful, granted. But people are also brutal. People are brutal. Have you noticed that? Been leading a church for over 25 years and, and uh, people often ask me this question. They say, Tony, what's the best thing about ministry? And I say, oh, that's real easy. It's people. I love people. We had 30 people baptised on Sunday night at the water world. It was amazing. That's worthy of a round of applause. I mean, so good. Do you confess? Yes. Do you confess? Yes. Do you confess? 30 people. Amazing. Seeing changed lives. Uh, seeing Daniel here this morning, uh, just celebrating what took place last Sunday night. As I look around the auditorium, see many others who got baptised last Sunday night. It's incredible. People are beautiful. Some of my greatest moments, all of my greatest moments, my most special moments in my life are around and involve people. But some of the hardest moments of my life also around people. Because people can be brutal. And when you do ministry, it involves people. And you get the best and you get the worst of people. And Jesus saw that and He was born into this incredible, messy, crazy situation. And that's why I love Jesus so much is that it wasn't sanitised. I think sometimes we do uh, uh, the Christmas uh, message and injustice when we sanitise it with our nativity scenes and we make it so sterile. But it was anything but that. The lyric says, the little Lord Jesus, no crying He makes. I don't know about you, but babies cry. And uh, if there's dogs barking or if there's cattle lowing, I'm telling you, babies get woke, awakened to that and they start crying. And, and I, I imagine Mary just getting little Lord Jesus to sleep and he's on the hay and he's finally asleep and, and, and the cattle, no, man, oh, come on. Just, oh. It's 
messy. Life is messy. But that's why Jesus came to get in the middle of your, uh, the middle of your mess to get in the middle of my mess and to bring a message of hope in the messiness of life. He came to bring meaning to our mess. You may have had a tough year. Some of you may have had an incredible year. This has been a year for us that we've done a lot of celebrating with birthdays and anniversaries and one thing after another. And so it's been a good year. But I know for some of you, it's been a really tough year. It's been a messy year. It's been a difficult year, but this I know, Jesus wants to come and bring meaning and hope and purpose to your mess. In actual fact, he wants to turn your mess into a message. It's really interesting, those who have been in the church for a while know that our 2016 was a tough year, and I won't go into all the detail, but what you will have noticed is how I've turned that messy year into a message. I've been able to share what took place in 2016 as part of my message right around the globe. And I've shared it in many ways, many different times here, and it's connected and touched with people. Don't let the messiness of your life take you out, but find Jesus in the middle of your mess because that's where he loves to dwell. That's where he loves to come. He started, his very first day on planet Earth was right in the messiness of a manger. A straw bed, cattle and donkeys making mess and noise. And there he was in the middle of all that mess. No room at the end. You're not welcome here. Maybe you don't feel that you fit in your sphere of influence or, or your friendship circle. Maybe you just feel like you're on the outer. That's what Jesus was born into. He's here to help you turn your mess into a message. And the third point is the mercy. Everyone say mercy. The mercy of the manger. You see, from the beginning of time, God has always loved people. I think the perception out there amongst the majority of people that we would call family and friends that are not connected to God as we are for the most part, see God as an old man with a long beard and a stick sitting on a cloud and he's angry. And I've got to be honest with you. If I was an old man sitting on a cloud with a stick and that was my eternity, I'd be angry too. <laughs> if, if that's all heaven is, yeah. let's be honest, I would be angry. But that's not heaven. Yeah. It's not what the Bible paints of heaven. Yeah. It's not who yeah. the Bible paints about our God. Yeah. He's a loving God. Yeah. And he wants to be in relationship with his people. And it's because of our sin. It's because of the things that we did wrong that separated the relationship that we once had with God and can have with God, but was separated because of what we had done wrong. And way back in the Garden of Eden, the very first human beings, they did the wrong thing. And instead of running to God and confessing their sins, guess what? They ran away and hid. Every parent will know the dilemma of trying to find their children when they've done the wrong thing. How many of us have to go on a manhunt? Where are they? And then when you found them, trying to get the true story out of them, we have, this, we have this, this inherent tendency to withdraw from those that love us the most because we don't have a true understanding or a true picture of God's heart of love. God, from the beginning of time, has always loved people. The very first people, Adam and Eve, he put in the best garden. Why? Because he loved them. He sent prophets and priests to love and to encourage God's people. The Old Testament is made up of God appointed, God anointed men and women bringing a message of hope and love. And for the most part, they were ignored or killed, persecuted. And the message of love was missed because of people's attitudes that miss the heart of God. These men and women were ignored, persecuted and killed. And then right in the Old Testament, we read of a 400-year period of silence. No prophets, no prophetesses, no word of the Lord. And it was after this 400 years of silence that this babe 
in a manger came. 400 years of silence and Jesus comes. What's the message in that? It's this, if you keep ignoring me, I'll keep loving you. See, the Christmas message is really simple. As a band come up, that'd be great. If you keep ignoring him, he'll keep loving you. And this world may not be what God intended it to be. This world may be messy and broken, but there's so much evidence of God's love in this world today. He came to us, as I've already mentioned, he took the first step. See, God is not the one who hides away. He's the one who comes to us. What I love about Christianity is that Christianity is about a God who didn't wait for us to get it right. He didn't wait for us to make sure that we cleaned up our own lives. He met us in the middle of our mess. He met us in the middle of our brokenness. He met us in the middle of our pain and our shame and our hurt. He came to us because he loves us. He didn't come to point a finger. He didn't come to tell us that we're doing the wrong thing. He came to let us know that he loves us. So this babe in the manger is an act of mercy. It's a second chance. And right throughout the life of Jesus, we see him offering his mercy and his second chances. On one occasion, a woman who was caught in the act of adultery was brought to Jesus, thrown down at his feet. And the whole scene was a setup. One, you cannot have an adulterous affair without another person, but there was only one woman. It was a setup. It wasn't about the woman, it was just about trapping Jesus. And they said, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. According to the law of Moses, she must be stoned to death. And Jesus being brilliant, full of wisdom, full of mercy, says, you're right. And he says, why don't you throw the stone at her? But only if you yourself is without sin. And the Bible says from the oldest to youngest, the oldest had a bit more wisdom to realise actually that that ain't me. And they did the Michael Jackson and just moonwalked out of there until it was just Jesus and this woman. And Jesus looks at her. And he says, where are your accusers? And she's looking around and can't see them anymore. He says, they're gone. And Jesus said this, then neither do I condemn you. He can deal with your past, but he's also interested in your future. And because he's interested in your future, he wants you to make good choices. And so he said, now go sin no more. Because your past brought you here. Let's, let's live a, a better life. And, and with Christ in our lives, we can, we can make better choices. We can, we can choose better paths. And we can live better lives. But right throughout his life, we see the mercy of Jesus on display. And Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. This moment right here is what separates Christianity from every other other religion. uh, religion. Other religions say that all roads lead to God. Christianity does not say that. Jesus said, I'm the only way. And and this is where Christians get the reputation of being narrow-minded. How can you say that you're the only way? We're saying we're not. We're actually saying Jesus is the only way. How can God be so narrow-minded to have one way? And if you've come today and you think that in your heart of hearts that God is narrow-minded to have only one way, can can I just put a spin on it? Can I just help you to see it from His perspective and not just our perspective? Because to say that God is narrow-minded is to truly miss the point. And when we ask, why is there only one way to heaven? It's the wrong question. In light of God's mercy to Adam and Eve, 
in light of His mercy to Cain and Abel, in light of His mercy to all those who went through the desert, in light of all those throughout church history who received prophet after prophet, prophetess after prophetess, after all the men that wrote the Scriptures to ensure that we have the Word of God today, chance after chance after chance after chance to be reconnected back to God. It's the wrong question to say, why is there only one way? In light of our absolute ignorance, anger, frustration, murder, slander that we have shown against God throughout the generations and throughout history. The real question is not why is there only one way? The real question is why does He give us a way at all? Why hasn't He given up on us? And I'll tell you why He hasn't given up on us. Because He loves us. And He offers us grace upon grace. He offers us mercy upon mercy. He offers us forgiveness upon forgiveness. He offers us chance upon chance upon chance. People say, do you believe in second chances? No, I don't. I believe in third and fourth and fifth and tenth and hundredth chances. I am a picture of God's grace. I'm not perfect. This church is not perfect. There's not a perfect person in this building. We are objects and recipients of the grace of God. Why is there only one way? Wrong question. The real question is, why is there a way at all? Why does He continue to love us as He does? Church history is littered with wars, arguments, strife, death, persecution. Every one of the disciples was killed and martyred for their faith. And they were just trying to say, God loves you. Jesus loves you. Killed. And here we are some 2,000 years later, still giving people a chance. What a God. What a lover of humanity. See, the picture we have of God for the most part is not the picture that is painted in the Scriptures. And as I've already mentioned, if we can get rid of this pulpit, that'd be great. The message of the manger and the message of the whole Christmas story is this, you matter to Him. You matter to Him. And I would hate us to miss the message because it didn't fit into our paradigm. I would hate us to miss the message because it didn't fit into our little way of thinking. Can we just close our eyes just for a moment? I want the band. Dan, just to sing. I'll let you do this all by yourself. You can play by yourself. You don't need my help. It's okay. Father, I thank you for your incredible goodness and kindness, your mercy and your grace upon grace that you lavish upon us. Why is there a way at all Why do you love us as you do? Why do you not give up on us? This is a profound mystery. This is the thing that stirs my heart to share your Word. And I pray that this Christmas eyes everywhere would be open to the incredible kindness and grace and the mercy of a Father in Heaven who loves them deeply and loves them dearly. Holy Spirit, won't You go before us this Christmas season and bring people into an awareness and an understanding like never before. And we ask all of these things in Your precious Name. Maybe there are some in this place right here, right now. You've never made that decision to receive Christ as Lord. He may have been a baby, but He was Lord, little Lord Jesus. This is a Lordship issue. In giving our lives to Jesus, we make Him Lord of our lives. And if you don't give your life to Jesus, you will give your life to something or someone else. 
And I count it a privilege and an honour right here, right now, to give you an opportunity to respond to Him, to come into your heart, to forgive you of your sins, to make you clean, to have a place in heaven, to be reconnected back to God. Maybe there are some like the prodigal son that have turned away from God. Today's the day to come back to Him. Don't live estranged, live connected. Don't live separated, live together with God. But it starts with a response from you. Jesus initiated this love moment when He came as a babe in a manger. And now He waits for us to respond to Him. As I've already mentioned, for every relationship to work, it takes two people. Jesus initiated, now He waits for a response. The Bible says it this way, He knocks at the door of our heart, but He won't knock that door down. He waits for us to open it up. He waits for us to let Him in. And if that is you this morning, you've never done that before, or you want to do it in a way of coming back to Him and being reconnected back to God and being part of His family again, I'm going to count to three. When I get to three, you raise your hand. We're not going to call you down the front. We're not here to embarrass you. We're here to celebrate the best decision a man, woman, or child can ever make because it changes the course of a person's life. One, God loves you. Two, He wants the very best for you. Come on, let's see those hands. Three, we're saying yes to Jesus. Yes to Him. We're saying yes right now, not to me, not to this church. We're saying yes to Jesus. Yes to Him being Lord. Yes to Him being Saviour. Yes to Him giving you a second chance. God bless you. I see your hands. There are others in this place. We say yes to Jesus. Yes to Him. Yeah, God bless you. That's awesome. Come on, let's stand very quickly, church. For those who responded, I want to lead you in a prayer. And this is a prayer that invites Christ into your life. But I'd love it if we could pray as a church family. No one should pray alone, not in this moment. You ready to pray, church? Those that responded, ready to pray, fantastic. Dear Jesus, little Lord Jesus, we pray that You would forgive me of all of my sins, to make me clean, to give me a second chance, to be Your child. Jesus, I receive You. I accept You into my heart as Lord, Saviour and friend. In Jesus' name. Come on, everyone said, Amen. Come on. Come on.